Aloha Kako. I'd like to welcome you to live from Noir Lab at Gemini. I'm your host, Jamika Marshall. I'm an outreach assistant here at the International Gemini Observatory, a program of NSF's Noir Lab here in beautiful Hilo, Hawaii. Before introducing today's special staff guest scientists, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping uh, items before we proceed. Those of you joining us, of course, in our YouTube live audience, again, we welcome you and we are excited to have you with us. Throughout the presentation, if you have a question or a comment that comes up, please feel free to go right ahead and put that question or comment in our YouTube live chat. Today joining us as moderator is outreach assistant Alyssa Leinani Grace, and she will be posting and or reading your comments and questions for, for us today. So no hesitation on adding comments or question in the chat throughout. Um, at the end, we will definitely have time for questions, but um, as, as questions do come in, Alyssa will pop in and ask your questions. So keep them going. Also, there is between a 15 and 30 second time delay in the live stream. So we appreciate all of you, your patience and understanding as we proceed. So with me today is a very special guest, Ms. Constance Walker. Connie Walker is an astronomer at Noir Lab in Tucson, who is a member of the Communications Education and Engagement Group. Connie has de dedicated much of her career to advocating for dark skies education, as well as the measurement and mitigation of light pollution. She's been in a leadership role in a number of organizations that work on dark skies protection. Inspired from an early age by astronauts landing on the moon and the original Star Trek series, which is dear to my heart, her curiosity for, uh, for anything ast astronomical propelled her to be the first in her family to go to college and earn a PhD. In the last 20 years, Connie has been a senior science education specialist and a scientist at NSF's or lab having a great deal of fun creating innovative programs on dark skies, astronomy research, and optics education. Um, this also includes uh, creating teen cafes, citizen science programs, and as well as sharing those all via workshops, talks, and events all across the globe. Now, Connie holds a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from Smith College, a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Massachusetts, and a PhD in astronomy from the University of Arizona. One cool thing about Connie is that um, Comet and Asteroid Discoverers, David Levy and Carolyn Shoemaker named Asteroid 29292 Connie Walker for her efforts in education and outreach. Outside of work, Connie loves uh, Greek dancing and Greek food. And that includes the cooking and the eating of Greek food. Opa. Thank you. <laughs> so um, thank you everybody. Um, I'm so um, honored to be here and I'm very happy to be here. And what I'd like to do, if it's all right with all of you, is to screen share. And I'm hoping that everybody can see my screen and I'm going to make sure I see everybody as well. Um, yes, I'd love to talk to you today about um, Globe at Night. Globe at Night is a citizen science program that you, everyone all over the world can participate in and really make a difference. And more on that in just a minute. Um, you know, Jamika, you stole my punchline. You, you mentioned already <laughs> something about my background that I was gonna mention in the next slide. But um, I, I just want, I usually start by saying how uh, there's certain things in my life that have inspired me to be where I am. 
And one of them was when I was a little girl, and this is going to date me, so you'll now know how old I am. And that's not something I always want to advertise. <laughs> but uh, in 1968, actually on Christmas Eve, the Apollo 8 mission was orbiting uh, the moon. And this was absolutely the first time they ever really got a snapshot that they shared with the world that just was jaw dropping, awe inspiring, really just thoroughly breathtaking. And it was, uh, you know, they weren't on the moon, but they saw the surface of the moon looking back at an earth that it was just, you know, the sun was shining on most of it, not all of it. And it just, it, it opened up the world of wonder to millions of people. And I was one of those millions. Uh, enough so that I, I wanted to know more and more and more about astronomy. And a lot of kids at that time, I think were in the same boat. But coupled with that, or the, the first run of Star Trek. And you can imagine never having that kind of show before. And all of a sudden there's this amazing show that makes you uh, dream about what the future could hold. And uh, what the original cast is shown here. So decades later, <laughs> I found myself in Tucson, Arizona, going for that PhD and uh, able to go out to the outskirts of town or to any of the observatories and merely look up and, and see the most incredible sight of, you know, what seemed to be billions of stars, but, uh, you know, thousands of stars in the night sky, so much so that you couldn't tell one group of stars from another, you know, one constellation from another. So it was pretty amazing and very inspirational. So Connie, you mm. are working in dark skies awareness. Mm. What is that and why is it that you were inspired to dedicate part of your career to this? Uh, okay, well, um, I usually start out with that answer to that question by asking people just to imagine in their own mind's eye, close their eyes if they want to, and imagine the first time or the most significant time they've ever seen a very starry night sky and how beautiful it was and to know that so many people now live in cities, you know, half, more than half the world's population. And so these people who live in cities, um, there's a good percentage, like 80% of them or so, who have never seen a starry night sky, I've never been to a place where they can just awe with wonder at, this, at the, all the stars above them. And so they don't know what they've lost. Uh, so in light of light pollution, to make a little joke there, um, they don't know that they're losing the night sky and all the inspiration that through the millennia that night sky has played in terms of, uh, of, of culture. You know, um, the, the people who have uh, like Starry Night, the beautiful Starry Night um, that Van Gogh painted or Holtz the Planets or uh, Shakespeare writing his sonnets, uh, all that inspiration for future generations is no longer there if they don't ever have the stars with which to inspire them. So that was one, th one reason, one very good reason, not just being an astronomer, but just losing that source of inspiration that really want, had me uh, continue on. And so, you know, you can think about when you've been out at such a dark site and you come back in to town, on your way in, you all of a sudden notice on the horizon, there's this sort of glow. And, and it takes, might take you a second to realize that that's actually from the city. And as you get into the city and you look up, you don't see those stars anymore. And that's because of all the light pollution, all the light that's being generated from the uh, street lights that are not shielded basically uh, at all. So the light is going up into the atmosphere, into space, and it's not used, it's basically wasted and, and it's creating this haze, this light pollution, as you might call it. So, um, so in, in that case there, uh, I didn't, I, I, oh, I should have mentioned, uh, sorry. In this particular photo, uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old. That picture was taken in 1908, um, and the bottom picture was taken in 1988. So there's an 80-year difference between these two photos of Los Angeles taken from the Mount Wilson Observatory, which is just on the outskirts of town, uh, looking at the city. And you can see, most definitely, the way the city has grown because the population has grown. So as the population grows in these cities, uh, so does the light pollution, unless we can do something to uh, shield those lights more and use what they call quality lighting, basically. So in, in effect, we have this global problem, but uh, it, it's actually, we're going to talk a little bit later more about how we can solve that 
locally. But in this picture here, this is from a satellite, or there's a couple of satellites that have taken these types of, of pictures where they've stitched together a sequence of nighttime photos from, uh, uh, of, of the world. And you can see in these pictures where <laughs> the most light pollution uh, originates from. And of course, it's the eastern half of the United States and most of Europe and actually the fishing fleet off of Japan, which that particular, it's very, very bright. It rivals the Aurora Borealis by being basically in second place. It's so bright. Um, so anyways, so I just thought I'd show you that too and to try to put things in a global context. So now, are there things that light pollution affects other than astronomy? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So for instance, um, it not only affects our, our ability to, to view the night sky and enjoy the night sky and also for astronomical research, but it also affects things like energy consumption, which is a big deal. And you can see in this picture on the upper left, uh, there's a car sales lot owner who wants to light up his car sales lot because he wants to advertise, obviously. And he's done such a, an intensive job <laughs> at doing that, that there's a lot of glare, basically. And I would put to you that probably there's a, a good a thief that would uh, be, have an easy job of, of stealing a car in that instance because he is hidden by the glare. But be that as it may, there's ways to light that, that, that you could use shielding and the light would be directed downwards onto the cars. You could see the cars, but you're not blinding people. And you can also see the night sky. So that's one, one thing that, that uh, is an example. Another area is our, our own health. Now we are what they call diurnal animals, basically. <laughs> we need the night just as much as we need the day. And what happens at night is that our levels of melatonin, which is a hormone that we manufacture inside of ourselves, uh, that actually is only um, built up again at night or repleted at night. It actually depletes in the daytime. And what, what happens is if you have too much blue light at night, uh, it actually doesn't allow you to, doesn't allow your body to manufacture the melatonin. And so things like your circadian rhythm get all disrupted uh, and you I can't focus in the daytime, you can't concentrate. Uh, and there's certain sort of conditions like obesity and diabetes, and actually two, um, it's linked to two uh, cancers now that um, actually uh, are affected by this, you know, this depletion of melatonin. Um, so the bottom line of this is that at night, if you can help it, don't have blue light at night, if you can help it. Um, and that will help you <laughs> maintain your circadian rhythm and also get a lot of sleep. <laughs> Um, but the last category is something that is really near and dear to my heart, and I think to a lot of people's heart, and that is animals. Um, and if we, um, if we go to this next screen here, um, this is how light pollution actually affects these various types of animals. It, it is really kind of a heart-wrenching situation. So we can't, animals cannot speak for themselves, so we're the ones that have to speak for them. And it's been shown by a lot of studies that um, artificial light of night can actually cause confusion and, and a change of their natural instincts because of too much light at night. So uh, what can happen is, for instance, there's a decrease in eating, in, in uh, reproduction, in uh, sleeping, and they can become more vulnerable to predators and other dangerous situations. So some examples, for instance, are with sea turtles. So sea turtles in Florida, when, when the babies are hatching, uh, the normal habits are that for them to go immediately into the ocean, right, after they hatch. But if there's a distraction of the lights on shore by buildings and, um, you know, hotels and things like that, they tend to want to go in that particular just, uh, direction. They're basically distracted and it can put them in all sorts of dangerous situations from, uh, you know, being run over if they go into a highway or a street to uh, predators being noticing them more and them never making it back into the ocean. But there's also migrating birds. Um, the situations where migrating birds are attracted by the lights from a city, uh, from buildings in particular, and they, they see it like a sunset. They start circling the building, they can get exhausted. They can overeat in the city and, and cause uh, a lack of food actually in the city for the birds. Uh, there's, uh, um, if starvation doesn't get them, the, the things like uh, chem the city chemicals can. And, and cars and things like that. And there's all sorts of bad situations there, especially with collisions and with buildings, which they do 
um, it's estimated that a million birds actually collide with buildings a year. So um, it's really kind of bad in that, that way too. So the bottom line here is we have to learn how to light properly, basically. <laughs> so, Connie, what can we do as citizen scientists to help the animals, to help our health, to reduce our energy consumption and be able to actually view a starry night sky? Is there anything we can do? Okay, well, okay, that's a good segue. Um, I talked about how this is a global problem, but like you said, we can actually do something on a, on a local level, right? And one of the biggest things you can do, the, one of the easiest things you can do is actually just shield your light like I, I alluded to before. And here you have a, a slide where there's sort of a not so great lighting on the left hand side. It's actually pretty bad. That's called a globe light. It lights everywhere, but really it's the only place that you need it. And so if you look at the sky above it there, you can barely see any stars. But if you look uh, to the example on the right of your screen, um, that, that particular light has a shade. It has a, what they call a shield and it lights in the downward direction. And you can see that little cartoon character. Um, and, and the sky above it has many, many, many stars. So it's a win-win situation. You're lighting precisely where you need it. And you can also preserve your ability to see the starry night sky. And uh, so here is an example, uh, just a, both a cartoon example and an actual example where you have a demonstration. And you can see on the left-hand side, you have a glary light. But on the right hand side, when you shield that light, it actually allows you to focus the light where you need it and not into the sky. Um, and now if we can, I don't know if we can uh, spotlight the Connie's cell phone, perhaps just for a minute. Like that always goes, does to, yeah, okay. Can you spotlight my cell phone? I don't know, let's try that. I'll it's try now spotlight. spotlighted. It's, oh, thank you, because I can't see that. So anyway, so, um, I hope I don't uh, <laughs> take up too much of my hand here, but, oh, sorry. Uh, it's going in the wrong direction. There we go. All right, so we have here um, a little city scene. We have a house in the background, this right here. We have a person trying to cross the street and a nice little light that pretty much exemplifies that, um, that, Let's see here. Connie? Yeah. You have to stop sharing your screen, sharing oh. the presentation. Yes, so ma'am. You can see your cell phone in full view. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm trying to see if it's on my thing here, but it's not. So I'm going to stop sharing as you suggested. And now you can see it, hopefully. Perfect. And, we, Perfect. Yeah, and what we see, basically, is a light that is very, very glary. And you can see that not only the glare is hurting people's eyes probably, but there is a window here where someone is actually trying to sleep. <laughs> and so it's called a light trespass. So that's two different types of light pollution, glare and light trespass. And if you had this as a dark room and you were able to see the stars in the night sky, um, you would also see that you would not be able to see those stars if you had a glary light blinding your, your, your uh, vision of the stars. So with, with a very simple solution, you can actually um, shield that light and the light's gonna go exactly where it's needed. That person can, and it'll go right onto the street. That person can safely cross the street and you have a win-win situation. No glare, no light trespass into the window and you're able to see the stars above. So it's a very nice little situation. Let's see if we can get back to screen sharing. Okay, which we should be back on the slide again. And uh, so I hope that uh, pounds in the idea. <laughs> it does, Connie. Uh, so now you have the, if we can put a, a cap on or uh, some kind of shielding on our light to help minimize light pollution, but are there other things that we as just regular everyday citizens can do to minimize light pollution in our communities? Yes, ma'am. There is, um, yeah, there's several things we can do and they're all easy. That's the thing. There's so many different types of light pollution out there, but this is one where we can actually easily solve. So if you look at this, this, uh, this slide, it is actually a postcard from the International Dark Sky Association. They're dedicated to preserving our night sky. And the first thing that they note is that you light only uh, what you need and where you need it, actually. Um, so they're, you know, they're doing just that, just right underneath the light there. 
Um, and then you use an energy efficient light bulb and you're conserving energy in the process. So instead of a 60 watt light bulb, you may only need as bright as five watts and that'll light exactly what you want and where you want it. And we already talked a little bit about shielding the lights and directing them downward. So that's the third thing on their list. But also what's really clever is using a timer. So you know, none of us really, except you're, if you're a real night owl, are up at three o'clock in the morning. So say you went to bed by midnight and you could set the timer to shut the lights off on the outside of your house at that time or earlier if you want. And you're not only um, helping uh, light pollution, minimize light pollution, but you're saving energy in the process as well. And also to save energy, you can use these warm white light bulbs, which are, um, you know, well, it's the right type of lighting, the yellow type of lighting, which they call for some odd reason, the warm white light bulbs is much better than using the cool white light bulbs, which is the blue light that I, I spoke of earlier. So stay away from those cool white light bulbs if you can and use those yellow or amber colored lights. And then if you want to, you can actually join for minimal cost IDA and they are just a plethora of knowledge and advice on their website, okay? So yes, so that, I hope that answers your question, Jamika. It does, it yeah. does. And in fact, so now that you've answered that, how can we get that information out to more people? How can we let people know how light pollution actually affects their lives? Well, great question. Uh, that's a good segue into Globe at Night. Uh, we we um, started this program 13, 14 years ago on the basis that we wanted to get people more aware of the situation of light pollution and how they can be involved uh, in redressing it. And so we started this, this, this citizen science program that lets everyone all over the world, anywhere, measure their night sky brightness and submit their observations to a website uh, from either a computer or a smartphone. Um, and it, the website's uh, www.globeatnight.org. And uh, that's, that's where all the information is and, and how to get involved. And we'll go into that maybe in just a minute. So it's a 10 day campaign each month when the moon is not out in the first half of the night. And the reason we do this is because the moon is like a natural light bulb in the sky. And if you really want to you know, measure that light pollution that's made by us instead of a natural light, then you don't want that moon up while you're taking measurements, basically. I think there's a question. What's her question? Hi, yes. Lisa. There is a question from our YouTube chat. Liz Fleming wants to know, what regions of the United States are doing the best job of minimizing light pollution? Uh, I think Flagstaff is one. Flagstaff is called the first uh, dark uh, sky city. And they have done uh, an amazing job of putting in the, what they call um, a phosphor coated amber LEDs. And it's a special LED that's uh, just a, a cool white, a warm white light that uh, doesn't use a lot of energy, but allows astronomers uh, to also do their, their, their research uh, because it only comes out in the yellow light and not the whole rainbow of colors as most white light LEDs do. And it lowers the energy consumption. It does a lot of good things. So, um, and it allows the sky to, with proper shielding, it allows the sky to be as dark as possible. So I'd say Flagstaff is one of the best cities for that. And Tucson comes in a close second because again, it has an astronomical community uh, just at the outskirts of town, no less than 65 miles away. And so the, the city has grown up around the fact that they want to try to keep the skies as dark as possible uh, so that the astronomers can still do what they need to do and people can enjoy the night sky. Good question, thank you. Uh, should we continue? <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, let's continue. So I wanted to boast about the most recent um, plethora of, of data that we got from the country of Australia. And this was amazing to me because it just happened like um, within the last campaign or so uh, that uh, Australia, because of a particular um, organization, I think it's called Australian, no, Australasian, Australasian uh, Astronomical Society or so. And they got all these people um, rallied up to take measurements all over Australia. And the thing is that most 
the, where they're populated are mostly at the edges, the western edge of Australia, the south, uh, I'm sorry, the eastern edge of Australia, the southeastern edge, and a little bit on the west side. That's where most of the population is. And what you're looking at here are the dots, right? <laughs> they're all these different colors. If you get a very bright dot, like a yellow or a white, that is where this, the um, measurements are brightest. So like Sydney, Australia is a very bright city. And then when you see a darker dot, that's where the skies are darker. So that's pretty much it. And I thought um, if it's all right with y'all, uh, we could go to the website and I could show you how I actually got that map. Uh, and I can introduce you a little bit more to the website itself. Um, and let me see what is that thing. Um, okay, got it. Okay. And I hope everyone can see this, the screen here. And what I should do first is go back to Globe at Night. Okay. And here's the front page. And this is, um, there's a bunch of tabs at the top and where you go to get the data, if you just wanna check out the data is maps and data. So you go there. And the first link up here is the 2020 data. And you see a world map and soon the data points will come on. Unfortunately, we have a lot more data points than are shown here. We have over 9,000 for just the last four months, but uh, it shows only 2,000 points here. Nonetheless, I'm going to um, zoom in on Australia, putting it in the center of my screen. And that's how you can pick any place in the world to examine whether there's points or not. And um, I, I, I don't know if you want me to show Hawaii, but we really need a lot more points from Hawaii, please. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so that's how we do it for uh, looking at where the data might or might not be in the world. So if you are someplace in the world, especially that's not monitoring at the moment, please feel free to, um, to go and uh, um, get some more data. Okay. So just to give you a uh, heads up on our, on our front page, we have all sorts of news for the moment, how we're connected to other projects. But what was really pretty good is one of our students made this absolutely wonderful um, video about how to take Globe at Night measurements. Jamika, would it be okay to go into this right now? Okay, thank you. So I'll start that up and let me see if I can go full screen. Are you seeing that or not? Okay. Yes. Good, thank you. What if a starry night sky had never inspired Van Gogh to paint starry night or Holst to compose the planets? The loss of something that has had a positive influence on our culture for thousands of years can change how we view the world. But if change happens slowly over time, will we even realize what we've lost? Citizen science is a rewardingly inclusive way to learn about important issues like the disappearing starry night sky, its causes and solutions. Globe at Night is an international campaign to raise awareness of the impact of light pollution by having citizen scientists measure night sky brightness and submit their observations from their own computer or mobile device. The data is used to monitor levels of light pollution around the world as well as learn about the impacts of light pollution on energy consumption, plants, wildlife, and human health. Globe at Night campaigns are held each month, span 10 days, and take place when the moon is not up. You can participate by going to globeatnight.org slash web app on your smartphone. Measurements should be taken more than one hour past sunset. The first step is to record when your observations were made. The second step is to record where your observations were made. The third step is to locate the current constellation of the month and select the chart which best represents the faintest stars visible in that constellation. The fourth step is to record sky conditions at the time of observation. For example, was it clear or cloudy? The fifth step is optional. You can input data from a sky quality meter if you have one. The final step is to click submit to send in your data. Your data will then be visible on the Globe at Night data map and you will have access to it to use for science projects. Scientists worldwide, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so now you should be back on the screen, I guess. Yep. And I think we've pretty much covered this. Um, 
I, yep, okay. So would you would like to know anything else about this web page or did you want to ask a question, Janika? Well, I do have um, a few questions, but first, okay. um, lovely introductory video um, <laughs> by, I think the young lady's name is Carmen. Fantastic. Um, now, is she, she's talking about data collection. How are the data used? Oh, well, that's a good question. Let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Okay, so let me see if I can advance this. Let's see what I have. Okay, so there are, are various ways that data has been used. And there's some fun ways and some very serious ways. And the first slide here are, is one of the fun ways, one of the most creative ways that I've ever seen the data visualized, okay? So there were these kids and these kids are like elementary and, and middle school age in, in, in uh, the border of Michigan and Indiana in a school district. Of, uh, and they took about 3,500, I think, globe at night measurements one year. And they decided they weren't gonna do the traditional way of, of you know, mapping and visualizing the data, but they, they wanted to, to do something with Legos actually. And they ended up building a Lego map, okay? And they also, built a computer, uh, a computerized version or visualization of that Lego map as well. As you can see at the top and the Lego map is on the bottom of the screen. And what they did is they put down 35,000 pieces of Legos and they were in layers of six colors. So the bottom is, was the faintest sky would be red and then orange, less faint. Um, uh, I should say the bottom was the brightest skies. And it got more and more dark as you went up until you went through orange layer, a yellow layer, a green layer, blue, and the darkest skies would be purple, right? But they ended up not having too many purple <laughs> Legos. They ended up taking away 12,000 of those 35,000 Legos to show what their map of their area, their school district looked like. And they ended up with uh, values of three and four, as you can see by the green and the, and the yellow. Uh, layer. So that's mo like most cities are about that particular level of brightness. Um, and so that was pretty cool. Uh, sorry, this, I have a trigger happy uh, mon uh, mouse here. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, and then uh, this next example is by again, uh, a bunch of high schoolers uh, led by Eileen Grabowski in the city of Norman, Oklahoma, with some amateur astronomers, and they decided they're uh, light pollution laws or what they call ordinances were not strong at all and they wanted to make them a lot stronger and they had to get evidence for their city council that they needed to strengthen these laws and so what they did was uh, do a survey of their whole city and uh, the center of this survey here shown in, on this map is actually the University uh, of, our, of um, Oklahoma and, um, and you could see <laughs> You can see how bright it is because the dots are bright and whether it's darkest is the neighborhoods where they were darker and up the upper left is the business areas where they were very bright again. So they brought this to the city council and convinced them, it took about two years to do so, but convinced them to make the laws much more strong than they were before. So kudos to Norman, Oklahoma for doing that. Um, and then one thing I thought the animal, the people who appreciate animals would really, really appreciate this. Uh, there's a bat called the lesser long-nosed bat. It is threatened and it is endangered uh, species of bat. And the uh, Arizona game and fish were very concerned as to the survival of this bat in the Tucson area. It lives in Saguaro National Park on the um, right-hand side of this diagram here. And every night it flies to uh, about 25 kilometers to an area northeast of it, northwest of it, sorry, called Push Ridge. And, um, and eats until morning and flies back. And so they, <laughs> we did a little project with them using the globe at night data. It took 3,500, and well, we'll talk about this, what this is later, but sky quality meter measurements. And, uh, <laughs> and that's night sky brightness measurements and made this map and saw that the, the pathway of these um, lesser long nosed bats actually uh, went around the city instead of through the city. The Arizona game and fish were worried that if it went through the city, we'd have to strengthen the lighting laws. But basically, because it did not, we did not have to pursue that avenue of um, action, basically. So it was a very interesting project. Yeah. It really is fantastic to see how this data can be used. 
Um, so if you could elaborate just a bit on, uh, you mentioned uh, SQM, Sky, uh, Sky Quality Meter. Can you uh, elaborate on what that is and how we use it? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, that Sky Quality Meter, I'm gonna hold one. Can you also see my, my little tiny? Yeah, okay, good. So in the picture here, you have a Sky Quality Meter. It is really only as big as a pack of cards. It's not huge at all. Um, but it does, if you press the button, it does take, I don't know if I could put this close enough to me, I guess, where you can see me and not my virtual background. Um, and if you press the button, a number appears up here and that is the brightness yeah, of, the, of the room or if you're outside the brightness of your, um, the sky above you. And the way to use this is to actually hold it above your head uh, and make sure there's nothing in the way uh, that's occulting your, your measurement. And then, um, and you know, basically, <laughs> the, the, the brighter, the, the higher the number, the darker the sky you have. So it could be 20, and it'll be a very dark sky. But if it's 13 or 10, it's very bright <laughs> around you. Um, and anyway, and then you can log that on the globe at night measurements. And let me just back up one slide here. If you remember, um, uh, Carmen in the video showed you uh, the sequence of uh, measure of um, steps you take with the Globe at Night app. And then the, very, the fifth step here where my cursor is, I hope you can see my cursor, is where you would put in the sky quality meter reading, whoops, if you had that sky quality meter. And not everybody does. <laughs> I tell you, this thing is trigger happy. <laughs> um, let me see where this is again. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. And then, uh, so, that, so that's where you would put in your measurement if you did have a sky quality meter. And a lot of amateur astronomers have one and, uh, and, and some of the general public too. So it's a good thing to know if you have it because it's a very objective measurement, right? right. All right, so where were we? <laughs> okay. So um, I just wanted to also let you guys know uh, when these uh, campaigns are. So if you chose, you could go out and it really does take only 30 seconds to take the measurement. But the, the thing to know, like Carmen said in the video, it is really good to go out when it's dark. You know, it can't be like a few minutes after sunset. It has to be at least an hour after the sun sets. And the, time, the thing that takes most time is just getting your, sky, your eyes adapted to the dark. So it might take 15 minutes for your eyes to get adapted to the dark so that you could take a reliable measurement. And what you're doing in taking that reliable measurement again is, uh, is, is looking at the maps that you're gonna see that are something like this. Let me try to go back here. So the chart one is like you're in New York City where you're gonna only see a couple of stars, but most of you probably are not in New York City. And then the uh, other one is like this one below in uh, the last one there. My goodness, it's trigger happy. Uh, is magnitude uh, seven, the seventh chart, where you're looking at uh, hundreds and hundreds of stars towards your constellation of the month. It's like uh, ice cream flavor of the month. <laughs> it changes every month. Uh, uh, this month is actually Leo, the lion. And, uh, and then you're gonna you know, um, just choose which of the charts is most like what you see, okay? So I'm not sure we actually went to the, the um, website itself to the web page, but we could we could have done that too. And uh, do you want to do that? Okay, she says yes. <laughs> so if I go back up to, I'm trying to figure out how to do that here. Okay, good. I go to this. We go back to here. Okay, we go to the report page on here, and it's going to show you the page that looks very much like what you were seeing on that uh, other screen, but close up. And you'll notice here, number one is very, very simple, date and time. And number two is your location. And I can talk more about that in a second, but if you have a smartphone, it is so simple because it automatically puts that information in for you. And you'll notice for it to be able to do that though, it asks you, uh, will you allow Globe at Night to access your location? And we don't really necessarily have your address, it's just, uh, we just know where your lat long is and we don't use it any other way but for the data. So you're gonna allow that location. And then when you do that, this will uh, immediately put in the date and time 
and you can see it's the correct time for Tucson at least where I am. And, uh, and then for your location, for some reason I didn't do that right now, but I could put in my uh, work address. Okay, oh, sorry. I cannot spell worth beans. Tucson, Arizona. And I think it'll find it on that basis. I map it and there I am. I'm on campus at the University of Arizona, which I'm really not right now, but that's, that's where I'm taking my measurement. And that's what they, I'm gonna put in for the uh, address. And you will see that there's other things like comments, but you don't need to put those in. The real thing you need to put in is number three and number four. Number three is the maps. And what you're doing here is merely putting in what, which of these maps looks most close to what you see in the night sky. And the judgment call on that is actually the faintest star you can see in the map that you can see in the night sky above you. So say I'm looking at this particular map right now, and I think this is a pretty faint star, probably one of the faintest ones that I can see in this. If I can see that in the night sky, this is the map I'm gonna choose. If, if it, so if you're in New York City again, couple of stars, national parks, a lot of stars. You can't tell one constellation from another. But if you're in a medium-sized city, you're probably going to see something like this. There's a backwards question mark for, Re for Leo, his mane or his hair. And it goes down to Regulus as the dot in that question mark. And then you'll see the back end uh, of the lion, which looks like a triangle. And so that's pretty much Leo. And that's where you're going to be facing when you take these measurements. And there's uh, things like Stellarium, which is a very good free uh, software on, on uh, like that tells you about the night sky or on your cell phone, there's, you, can, you can get many free uh, planetarium type of programs which shows you like Star Walk um, that, that shows you um, where things are in the night sky to get you in the right area where Leo is so you can take these measurements. So um, there's a method to all this madness. And uh, if we can have your involvement in doing this, we'd be so, so um, fortunate. It, and then after you, you, wherever you leave your thumbnail, whether it's three, four, five, wherever you leave it is your measurement. So I'm saying that my night sky is gonna look like this from downtown Tucson at, the, at our headquarters. And then the only other thing you really need to do is to put in what kind of sky you have. Is it clear? Is it cloudy, partly cloudy? Or if it's very cloudy, you probably shouldn't be contributing measurements because <laughs> we can't really use the data. So hopefully it's a good night for you. And then of course, if you have that sky quality meter and number five, you're more than welcome to put that reading in the first line. You don't have to put anything in the second line if you don't want to. And then you hit submit and you are done. So basically, if you have a smartphone, you really only need to fill in three and four if your smartphone has filled in one and two and otherwise you're done. And it takes exactly 30 seconds to do this, <laughs> but 15 minutes to get dark adapted. So there you go. And do you have any questions on this? Yes, Connie, actually. Um, so let's say I'm outside, I have my cell phone with me. Um, I've watched the video with Carmen. So I have all of my materials. Um, and it's getting dark about 745. How, how long do I need to wait for my eyes to become uh, dark adjusted, as you mentioned? Does that vary by well, reading? On average, no, on, on average, it, well, if it's, if it's getting dark and it's actually dark outside, you, you, for most people, it's 15, 20 minutes at most, uh, 10 minutes for a young kid. <laughs> but probably uh, on average, 15 minutes would, would do it, yeah. Okay. All right. And so how, so since you've, you've made, uh, you've made this collection of data and, sub, and submittal process really efficient, um, how often can I do this, say, in a night? Oh, I, I love mean, it. I have my friends with me. Can we do it a couple of times a night? You can do it 10,000 times if you want to. <laughs> Uh, we would appreciate any and all measurements because it really does help when it comes to monitoring and using the data for all the purposes that I stated before, you know, yeah. People have done, you know, studies with animals. People have done studies with um, mitigation for, you know, um, how well if, some, if a place is getting brighter or darker. Uh, they've done it to strengthen the laws. All these reasons I've given before, yeah. Excellent. And so now that we know 
how to participate. We know the website and we see the dates that uh, this campaign is going to be going. Um, I, I recall that during the May campaign, uh, specifically May 16th, um, there's also the International Day of Light. Can you mm -hmm, tell us about mm -hmm. that? Oh, sure, yeah, let me get, uh, okay. yeah, the International Day of Light. Um, well, a few years back in 2015, we actually had the International Year of Light. And that was a very special year, just like a few years before that, there was the International Year of Astronomy. Well, the International Year of Light is actually uh, being organized, or was organized um, by a lot of big companies that have to do with lighting, like Philips. Uh, because, you know, from their standpoint, light is the, is the most magical thing that, that humanity has created in all the world. And, uh, and it's true, but um, as a little reminder of the fact that we really have to um, light responsibly, basically, and not you know, um, pollute the, light, the, the, the night sky with light, but to, to use it so that you have quality lighting and you're only lighting the ground. We sneak in there a little bit and they've allowed us to do, they've been very generous. They've allowed us to have a cornerstone project uh, that deals with uh, basically light pollution and quality lighting. So they continue the tradition every year since 2015 and they have every year on May 16th, they have the International Day of Light and again, we're, we're able to use uh, Globe at Night as one of the focal um, events of that particular day. And so we are admonishing everybody to please get involved on that one night, uh, at least during the campaign and take as many measurements as you like from as many locations as you like, because more locations is better. Uh, it allows us to, to you know, blanket the uh, investigations we do, the monitoring we do uh, to be able to take more than one location. The measurements in one location. So take it in many places. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Janika? Yes, Connie, thank you so much for that clarity. Well, good, I'm glad. Um, and I haven't seen Grace pop, uh, Alyssa pop up at, at all, uh, but um, so maybe she'll have questions after we stop here, I don't know. Do there are no questions right now from the chat, but we do have a couple of nice comments. Liz Fleming says, a starry night sky is truly beautiful. And Dale and Harriet Dupieu say, no questions. Watching from Shreveport, Louisiana. Oh. Our observatory doesn't have as many issues with light pollution, but everyone can take steps to improve the night sky. Thanks for your program. Yes, that's a, a beautiful comment. Um, I'm so happy for you that you don't have light pollution problems at this point in time, but it's always good to be able to monitor in case things do flare up in the future. Uh, you wanna be ready and uh, to take steps towards, um, you know, maintaining that quality lighting so that you never have to fight light pollution issues. Yeah. So, so I, I end with, um, with this starry night, this picture of starry night from Van Gogh and his quote that I often think of the night is more alive and more richly colored than the day. And uh, he had a, a very unique perspective and I, I can understand it very much because it's really part of our cultural heritage, this night sky is a gift that, uh, that we have been given. And so because we've been given this gift, we really have to be the ones that, that are the stewards of the night sky and protect it as much as we can for all the various reasons that I gave before. Because truly, 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 it is an inspiration, especially to our next generation. And we don't want to uh, have them be, uh, not have the opportunity to be inspired by the night sky. So I hope you will join me in, in any future Globe at Night campaigns in order to, uh, to maintain that level of monitoring and, and, uh, and awareness about the light pollution issues so that we can be more mindful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Constance Walker. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, what if our audience wants to, they're excited about the Globe at Night and they want to participate and they're on the website, but they want to connect with you and ask a specific question. Um, do we have information that we can share? Oh, absolutely. Let me see if I can get there. Here we go. Um, this is how to find me. <laughs> my my, most, my um, email is at the bottom. There's also email that they have that you could use from the Globe at Night website, which is basically globeatnight um, at nwao.edu. 
So both of those emails will, will get to me. And I, I would have put my, my office number, but I'm not at my office. <laughs> so please feel free to use my email. Excellent. Thank you so much, Connie. We have one more question from the chat from Peter Michelle. He wants to know, what is being done to protect skies over Mauna Kea? Oh, that's probably a question he could answer since he lives there. <laughs> yeah, um, well, um, I'm not as mindful as probably Peter is on the, answering this question, but there have been uh, lights that have been recently, I think, uh, installed that are, are a little bit higher, I think maybe what they call 4,000 Kelvin, not really 3,000 Kelvin. And the reason why I'm talking about Kelvin is a temperature scale. Um, lights are kind of rated on, on what their temperature scale is. And the lower the temperature, um, they are gonna be more of a yellowish type of light, which is what you want. The higher the temperature, the more blue. So anything over 4,000 is considered very blue. Uh, and so what they've done is that they've, I think installed a 4,000, if I'm not, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, in, in most of the areas around the observatory, uh, which is a, a good solution, but not the absolute best, if that. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers the question for you, but yeah. Thank you, Connie. We appreciate that so much. Fantastic answer. And we appreciate you joining us today to talk about the Globe at Night program. Now, um, in the description, under the video description, we will have a link to the Globe at Night webpage, as well as um, some, uh, the link to Connie's site for her information. Thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for now, inviting me. Absolutely. And we look <laughs> forward to having you back to see if Hawaii was able to uh, meet your challenge of getting in some good amount of observations for the sky at night. I will definitely make a point to at least send in a few, Connie. So when you come back on, you'll let us know how Hawaii did compared to other places. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. So before we wrap up, I'd like to do a quick science update. Let me share the screen here. So researchers using a technique known as lucky imaging with the Gemini North Telescope on Hawaii's Mauna Kea have collected some of the highest resolution images of Jupiter ever obtained from the ground. Now, these images are actually a part of a multi-year joint observing program with the Hubble Space Telescope in support of NASA's Juno mission. The Gemini images, um, one, uh, you can see the overall image hopefully on the screen, gorgeous view of Jupiter. Uh, these Gemini images were combined with the Hubble and Juno observations so that it reveals that lightning strikes and some of the largest storm systems that create them are actually formed in and around large convective cells over deep clouds of water, ice, and liquid. Now, these new observations also confirm that dark spots in the famous Great Red Spot are actually, in fact, gaps in the cloud cover and not due to color variations. Now, um, we will have a link to this press release in uh, the video description below. So if you would like to find out more, please feel free to check that out. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this Constance Walker speaking to us about the Globe at Night program. We hope you can join us next week when your host will be Alyssa Leinani Grace. She will be having as her uh, special staff guest scientist, Dr. Jason Chu, as they speak about astrophotography. We look forward to seeing you. Mahalo and aloha.